want to welcome to the program the Executive Vice President of Policy and the Chief Economist at ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. Jonathan Williams, welcome to the show, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Greetings from the land of make-believe up here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> well, uh, well, welcome. I do appreciate you making some time, and you are one of the um, uh, one of the co-authors, right, of this uh, this Rich States, Poor States, 16th edition, along with Arthur Laffer and Stephen Moore. So uh, first off, tell us, what is this uh, this annual report? What do you guys look at? Well, we, uh, we've been putting this report together as a way for concerned citizens and business leaders and especially state legislators in Raleigh and other state capitals uh, to really have a way to measure themselves against the other 49 states to say, how do we stack up when it comes to how economically competitive we are and what's our economic outlook going forward? And the things that we look at in the report to get the, the ranking that you talked about is uh, tax policy. We obviously just went through tax day. Uh, it's at the front of everybody's mind still. You know, regulations, labor policy, things that we know matter for economic growth in the future. But also, I think just importantly, uh, things that state legislators directly can change in a given year. So I heard it referred to in the National Review article uh, that uh, what explains America's emerging Southern success story is that it has to do with low taxes, limited government, and liberty, or as I call them, the three L's. Although I had a a, a listener uh, send in a fourth L, which was liquid freon, uh, air conditioning. Yes, I think that actually has helped contribute to the rise of the New South as well. Uh, So what do you think of uh, about that? Low taxes, limited government, liberty, and maybe or not air conditioning. Well, you know what? Uh, you know, it is all about freedom and, and liberty, right? And uh, the state governments that are doing well, the ones that are growing their economies, are the ones that people want to go to instead of leaving these high tax states like New York and, and California and others, uh, they keep taxes low. They have a reasonable uh, regulatory environment and uh, they, they welcome businesses in. They don't try to regulate them out or try to tax them out. That profit's not a dirty word, right? And the states that are getting it right, they do value the freedom of the individual. But the important thing there is that, you know, what empowers this freedom is the founders of America put together our system of federalism, right? That we have these 50 laboratories of democracy that allow Americans to vote with their feet and go across state lines when they don't like the living conditions in one state or don't have a job in one state and are looking to make themselves and their families' lives better off. And same thing with businesses. And so every single year, this is one of the most key findings of our book over the last decade and a half is almost to a state, when you get it right when it comes to public policy, you're going to see more people wanting to come into your state. And of course, that brings in revenue, it brings in jobs, it brings in tax collections. And so that's the virtuous cycle of when you empower individuals and businesses to maximize their own future, it's something very healthy for the states. So when comparing the Carolinas here, um, I couldn't help but notice, so there are two different rankings um, or numbers, I should say, that are uh, scores that the states uh, get here. One is economic performance rank, And the other is economic outlook rank. So we're number two. North Carolina is number two in the outlook ranking. So just looking forward, it's prospective. Uh, We're number two. We look very good. I think we're only behind Utah in that regard. But South Carolina's economic outlook ranking is 21. Um, But then you look at the economic performance ranking, and South Carolina is actually better than North Carolina. They're nine, and we're 10. So Can you explain what those different uh, measurements are, the economic performance rank versus the economic outlook rank? Yeah, the performance rank is a backwards-looking measure going back 10 years, looking at uh, migration, as we were just talking about, talking through job creation and overall economic growth. And, uh, you know, South Carolina has been a generally better than average competitiveness state, as you point out there at 21 right now for economic outlook. And, you know, North Carolina, it's only been in really the last decade that North Carolina has really turned it around when it comes to competitiveness. If we were talking a decade ago, North Carolina would have ranked in the mid 20s in economic outlook. And uh, because of uh, then Speaker Tom Tillis and the legislature and Governor McCrory and others, you know, that became uh, a flat tax state. And you've done all the great things to make North Carolina this much more more competitive. And the economic results are encouraging. But, you know, this has only been within the last 10 years that North Carolina has really turned the corner on becoming one of the most economically free states in the country. So sometimes the results do take a uh, time. And also South Carolina has a lot of positive things that they've done as well in terms of cutting taxes, maybe not as aggressively in North as in North Carolina's case. But, you know, South Carolina is another great example of a state that's getting it right. 
So are you aware, I'm sure you're aware of some of the criticisms that exist of this analysis. I've got one here from Peter Fisher. Do you, have you ever heard of this fella, Peter Fisher, with the, uh, let me see here, the Iowa Policy Project? Have you ever heard of this guy? Oh, yes. They're the type that think that higher taxes are good for you, as you say. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they, they really don't uh, understand on a basic level why individuals and businesses are moving, right? I mean, in to some sense, they'll say that it is just about the weather, that people are moving to the south. And that's why Florida and Texas are booming in their example. And it has everything to do about other things except for the things that actually do matter uh, for why people move. And we actually know this from the U.S. Census. They take a survey of why people move from one state to another. And number one on the list is economic opportunity. People are looking to make their lives better and their families' lives better. And by the way, if it was all about just the weather, I know your, your listener there was doing that half in jest. But, you know, if it was all about the weather, California would be booming. And, folks, California is the biggest out-migration state of jobs and capital and individuals, one of the highest over the last decade. I mean, in fact, they lost so many people, they lost a seat in the United States Congress because of the out-migration of California. And, of course, they have the most beautiful weather on Earth in California, but some of the worst policies and highest taxes. I think the great weather in California makes them all a little nuts. I, it's the only thing I can decipher. It's like if you live in that kind of perfect weather for so long, like you, something happens to your brain. Like you don't, like you have to go through, you know, the different seasons. <laughs> you have to go through a winter in order to build some sort of mental toughness or something. I don't know. I, I, I would love to see somebody study that. And also, like to your point about the weather, I, it makes sense that somebody in Iowa would be saying that it's only about the weather because they're in Iowa. So, I mean, th that does make sense. Uh, if you're trying to, you know, make up some uh, some excuse for why people don't want to be in Iowa. But the but his argument is that, look, all of the things that Alec is um, is rating highly. Right. These are things that I mean, he says uh, uh, this is stuff you're just, you know, promoting fiscal austerity, taxing lower income people more than wealthy uh, wage suppression. Um, uh, he says uh, it provides a recipe for economic inequality and declining incomes for most citizens and for depriving state and local governments of the revenue needed to maintain, you know, infrastructure and investment. So what's your response to, to the criticism? Uh, almost sounds like Joe Biden there. For a second. I got <laughs> confused. Uh, you know, but I mean, really, the, the bottom line and you know, Jack Kemp, who is a great friend of Alec and, of course, a real leader. Uh, nationally in, in the space in Congress and, and advocating for good tax policy for years, you know, put it this way, and I think he's exactly right. You know, in terms of austerity and that criticism, you know, you don't raise re real revenue in the long term for a state by raising tax rates. You raise the amount of revenue for your state by having more taxpayers come into your state, more businesses open up in your state. And when you see the success of North Carolina, you, you've lived it. You've seen 600,000 new Americans come in on net over the last decade alone after you created the real tax reform that became a flat tax and did all the things that's made North Carolina the second best in rich states, poor states. And of course, the revenues keep coming in. You had so many revenues coming in. The surpluses are still there in Raleigh, and you had enough revenue to give teachers pay raises. Now, it doesn't sound like austerity to me. It sounds like when you get a tax policy right, you make yourself more competitive. It's going to be a holistic win for everybody across the board. It's one of these it's one of these arguments and it's overly simplistic. But the first time I heard it, I said it makes sense when you say it like that. It's that, you know, this difference between that if you get a bigger piece of the pie, then I have to get a smaller one. But it's it's also a failure to recognize that the pie grows. Right. Like the, the pie is not a static sized pie. That's right. Exactly. And the, the upward mobility that is available in the states that are growing jobs versus the states that follow this formula on the other side that he would argue for, which is higher taxes and higher regulations and then more government involvement and subsidies. Uh, you know, these you know, individuals are deciding that st doesn't work for them. That's why they're leaving places like New York. If that was the sanctuary for, you know, individuals, right, New York would be booming too because they followed that approach that Reagan warned us of. If it moves, tax it. If it keeps moving, regulate it. If it stops moving, subsidize it. You know, that is the approach on the other polar opposite of what you all have been doing in North Carolina. And it's clear which which one that American people, when they when they have the ability to choose, and they do, they vote with their feet towards freedom every single time. I, but we're full. I think we're full now. So if if everyone could just stop coming now. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> oh, I kid. I can't. South Carolina just needs to keep up. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Uh, Jonathan Williams, the Executive Vice President of Policy and Alex Chief Economist. I appreciate your time, sir. Have a great weekend. You too. Take care. All right. Take care.